In the last episode in this NASCAR Legends Saga, I talked about Jimmy Johnson's best of times and worst of times during seasons 2011 through 2013. Today I'll be talking about his 2014, 15, and 16 seasons. Now before I get to that, if you haven't already done so, feel free to hit the subscribe button and drop a like to gain more support for this small but growing channel. It will help me a ton and for that, I thank you that have done so, or in this case, done it as soon as I said it just now. But now we got that out of the way, onwards with today's feature presentation. So we hit the year 2014 and Jimmy Johnson as well as the race fans had the same thing in mind. With Jimmy's performance from the past seasons, he could be up there with Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt's record tying 7 championships. However, accomplishing that feat would be no easy task, especially with the new playoff system. We're going to put those to the side for now and begin discussing Johnson's 2014 season. So let's begin. To start off, I'll grade Jimmy Johnson's Daytona Speed Week's performance a C. That's it, just a C. Reason being is that he wrecked in the Sprint Unlimited and was also involved in a multi-car crash coming to the checkers in one of the Budweiser Twin 150 events. However, come the day of the Great American Race, he rolled off the starting grid from the 32nd position but would rally his way back to the front with the front runners. Not to mention, he would lead the race for 15 laps, finishing inside the top 5 when the race was over. Phoenix and Las Vegas, he would place in 6th. Bristol and Fontana, mediocre finishes of 19th and 24th soon followed. But it was still early in the season and Johnson would find himself coming so close to winning for the first time in 2014 at Martinsville for the SDP 500. Having the lead for most of the race for 296 laps, he would finish in second to his former rival, Kurt Busch. Even though Johnson finished 25th at Texas, a third place finish at Darlington made up for it. This would be followed by a mediocre run in Richmond as well as losing control, crashing and spinning at the Talladega race in the Airlines 499. Then in Kansas, he placed in 9th. Come Charlotte for the World 600, Johnson secured his first pole of the year and his first win of the year. Well, it used to, this used to be Jimmy Johnson's house and uh, then they repaid the joint and they got away from me, but looks like they got it back tonight. This is Johnson's seventh win here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. First win of 2014 for Jimmy Johnson, Chad Knauss, and the Lone Chevrolet. Yeah. Well done, Jimmy. Well done, buddy. Did a great job today. Thank you for all your hard work and your patience. This was his seventh win at the Charlotte facility and his fourth win in the 600 miler. Next up was Dover and Jimmy Johnson would once again come out on top. Having to dominate the race, having one of the fastest cars, he went to Dover's victory lane for the ninth time, scoring back to back at the facility and the 2014 season. Single filing it down the back straightaway, one battle toward the back, Marcus Ambrose, Jeff Gordon for 15. Out of turn four, Jimmy Johnson, the low Chevrolet, scores its 68th Sprint Cup win in the FedEx 400. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, team. Off the bed. Winning two in a row was definitely a positive to start off the summer season. A sixth place run in Pocono, and finally having a win in Michigan. You can cross Michigan off the list. The six-time champion going to get his first Michigan trophy this afternoon. Seals Point, he would place in seventh. Then in Kentucky, he would score a top ten. However, things were back to the negatives 
considering being involved in one of the big multi-car wrecks in the beginning portion of the Firecracker 400 at Daytona. The next week at New Hampshire, it got worse. Crashed out and the end results are a 42nd. The same goes for the Firecracker 400, ranking in that same position due to not finishing the race. Indianapolis was... eh... qualified 11th only to finish 14th, not leading a single lap. This would be followed by a tire blowout at Pocono, which resulted 39th. Then came Watkins Glen, where he placed in the 28th position. Coming to the conclusion of the summer season, Johnson would return to top 10 numbers, starting at Michigan, placing 9th. Huh, speaking of which, having to race really aggressive for position, both Johnson and Ryan Newman, who edged out Johnson for the 2002 Rookie of the Year award, exchanged words in the garage during the post race. Despite that, the rest of the results of the final races of the regular season were a 4th in both Bristol and Atlanta along with an 8th at Richmond. And at Richmond, after the race was over, Johnson climbed out of his car and collapsed to the ground, passing out due to dehydration. Pushing that aside, Johnson would still be able to continue and compete for the championship with 10 races remaining, under the new playoff grid system. Even though the 48 team would place 12th in Chicagoland, they would come into New Hampshire with a strong car. Even though they wouldn't lead a single lap, they were up there. When the race concluded, they would rank in 5th place. A 3rd place outing would come a week later in Dover. The playoff Kansas race took more of a turn for the worse, considering Greg Biffle sliding up the racetrack right into the left rear of Jimmy Johnson's car sending them both spinning. It was all or nothing for Johnson to advance into the next round. Otherwise, chances of winning seven championships would have to wait to 2015. Charlotte was where he would place a mediocre 17th. Talladega, on the other hand, was good and bad at the same time. The good part about it was that he qualified second on the grid and from the drop of the green flag had one of the fastest cars, having to lead the most laps of 84. Despite that, he had to win the race in order to advance into the round of 8. This is where the bad comes in. He failed to win the race. And what made it worse is that not only is he eliminated from the chase, but also ranked 24th when the race was over. The final four races saw Johnson finish in 32nd at the paperclip of Martinsville, then dominates the Texas race, leading the most laps of 191 en route to a victory. Following a crash in Phoenix and a ninth in Homestead. In the end, the 48 team would rank in 11th in the final standings when the 2014 season came to an end. Jimmy Johnson's stats from the year are this. 4 wins, 11 top 5s, 20 top 10s, only 1 pole, led 1,310 laps out front, and had an average finish of 15.3. The start of the 2015 season was up and down, considering being involved in a crash in the Sprint Unlimited to kickstart the new year. Then, in the second Budweiser Twin 150 qualifier, Johnson redeemed himself in the event, winning the duel for the second time in his career. Jimmy Johnson for the win! The Gibbs cars can't catch him! The conclusion of the Daytona 500 saw Johnson and the 48 team rank a valid fifth. They would turn this around into a win in the second race of the year at Atlanta. Las Vegas would turn out to be abysmal considering certain types of issues and handling with the race car, which would later result into a 41st place finish. Because of this, this dropped Johnson back from 2nd to 7th in the standings. He would stay in that position for the next two races, being Phoenix and California, settling in 11th and 9th respectively. A 35th place finish in Martinsville dropped Johnson back more spots, ranking 10th in the standings. 
but it is still early in the season, and the 48 team would eventually have the proper winning chemistry to be in top form once again. It would come sooner rather than later, considering they would come out on top at Texas, leading the most laps and cruised to victory lane for the second time in 2015. Now Johnson was in 6 in the standings, as he gained 5 points for leading laps and extra bonus points, nabbing the win. Then in Bristol for the Food City 500, they rallied from 28th on the starting grid to an impressive 2nd at the race's conclusion. This would put him in 4th in the standings. Things would run smoothly at Richmond and Talladega settling for 3rd and 2nd. In Kansas, Johnson would make the Spongebob community very proud, considering coming in clutch when it counted most. Having to pass Kevin Harvick late in the race, whom had one of the fastest cars, for the win. High toward the wall, drops it down, but Jimmy Johnson How about that, is well, going to win there, Kansas, and that's Earl Barber in the spotter making good on his promise as he guaranteed a top three tonight. 2015 was the year of another horrid World 600. Handling would play a huge factor in this one. Johnson found out when he realized his car kept getting loose all around the track mainly in turns 3 and 4. It would eventually get away from him on lap 90. He didn't hit anything that time, but would hit the wall when the car got away from him again on lap 274. With another poor World 600 run aside, onwards to Dover Downs, which I was there to witness in person. And considering at the time, I despised Johnson. I walked out of the grandstands not happy. And you can probably guess why. Side by side for fourth. Truex fades to seventh. Menard's right there. Kane back there with him. Three car breakaway. Three wide into turn three. Everybody wants the fourth spot. But Jimmy Johnson, the all time winner at Dover, it's over. Ten wins for Johnson. Yep. Jimmy Johnson not only won again in the year, but it was also his 10th Dover win. The summer season results looked like this. 3rd in Pocono, 19th at Michigan, 6th at Sears Point, 2nd at Daytona, 9th at Kentucky, 22nd at Loughton, 15th at Indy, 6th coming back to Pocono, Watkins Glen was where Johnson ranked 10th and an abysmal 39th at Michigan following tire issues and because of it made a small mistake coming into his pit box. To conclude the regular season, the rest of the results are a 4th in Bristol, 19th at Darlington, and a 9th at Richmond. After the Richmond race, Johnson found himself tied for the lead with Kyle Busch and Matt Kenseth who won the Richmond event. The start of the playoffs in Chicagoland at the middle portion of the race, on one of the restart attempts, Joy Logano gave Johnson a shove coming to the green, which gave Johnson no other choice but to dive below Kevin Harvick for the race lead. Once he had done so, the two drivers would make contact, and resulting Harvick's left rear to blow out on him just a few laps later. During the post-race, it came down to a bit of an physical altercation with mainly Harvick. And so they're going to discuss it. And maybe a little more than discussion. And see, this sport's full of emotions, you know. Kevin Harvick feels like he was done wrong and he wants to express his displeasure with Jimmy. These two work really closely together, you know, making their cars faster, but you can see Kevin's not happy with Jimmy. That's what the playoffs do. Despite a 6th in Loughton, a turn for the worse would take place at Dover. Following issues with the driveline, this would not only put Johnson in the garage area for a period of time, but this would result coming back onto the track numerous laps down, finishing in 41st. As a result, Jimmy Johnson's chances of winning title number 7 
would have to wait come 2016, since he's at this point eliminated from the chase. The next race at Charlotte, things only got worse. Kansas, the 48 team would turn things around with a third place finish. Talladega, Johnson would lead for 34 laps, only to finish 18th. Martinsville, the team would come home 12th. In the closing stages of the Texas race, Johnson timed his move at the right time with less than 5 laps to go, passing race leader Brad Keselowski, who led the most laps. Johnson's made the bottom work, I think you have to take that away from him. As soon as he went to the bottom, the 48 made an adjustment and went to the top. Now Jimmy's going to look to try to roll this momentum right here. This is his chance. This is the closest he's been to the exit of two. Going to close to you, coming to you inside. Inside. Has the preferred line now to the bottom of the track. Can he complete the pass? He does. Jimmy Johnson in front of Texas. Jimmy Johnson will lead six laps, but the most important one as he comes out of turn four. Johnson wins in Texas again. Phoenix, Johnson would qualify on pole, lead 44 laps, and rank P5. And to wrap up the 2015 season, a 9th place effort in Miami, along with a 10th in the final standings, was definitely a positive way to end another good year. Jimmy Johnson's stats from the 2015 season are this. 5 wins, 14 top 5s, 22 top 10s, one pole, one DNF, led 558 laps in the lead, and had an average finish of 12.8. 2016 would prove to be once again a rocky, rough start to the new season, as Johnson would spin into the grass on the backstretch, causing damage to the front nose in the Sprint Unlimited. But it doesn't end there. On the last lap in the second Can Aim Twin 150, Johnson gets dirty air from Jimmy McMurray, setting the 48 low Chevy sideways and into the wall, causing a multi car crash. Although, the Daytona 500 was a decent run, having to lead 18 laps in the event, ranking P16. Speaking of which, he almost let the car get away from him at one point, but manages to save it. Having to score two wins early in the season at the Atlanta race, as well as the California race, Johnson was, as expected, already in championship form early on during the regular season. Coming into Texas, the Lowe's team thought it would be a good idea to change the color of the number back to yellow. You could say that it proved to be bad luck with results of 23rd in Bristol, 22nd at Talladega, 17th in Kansas, 25th in Dover, lest we forget about that one particular restart that cost Johnson dearly. He would score a third and lead five laps in the Coke 600, but in his patriotic livery that ran in the event the year before. Anyway, this is where it really starts to kick in. With abysmal results of 35th in Pocono, 16th at Michigan, 13th at Sears Point, Daytona, 35th, following a crash that Jamie McMurray particularly caused. At restrictor plate racing, four wins, and we've got trouble behind him, Rick. Around they go. It looked like it was Eric Almarola that was the first to go sideways and then collecting numerous cars behind him. Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy comes up at the McMurray, actually comes down and gets onto the left front. It's on from there. I mean, we talked about it earlier. As soon as somebody makes a mistake and you're in this big pack of cars, you're going to take a lot of people with you. It's just how it happens. You can some of these cars riding around the back actually got in the rack as well. So one, one mistake by a driver, a mistake by two drivers, and this is what happens. It's not just those two. And a bump there by the 48, the back bumper of Jamie McMurray. 78 of Martin Trucks Jr. caught up. Danica Patrick also. Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the 88. 
Brian Scott up on the hood of the four of Kevin Harvick. Chris Busher, 23-year-old out of Prosper, Texas, was involved. Another crash in Kentucky, which resulted in 32nd and 12th in New Hampshire, put the Lowe's team over the pressure edge. The Watkins Glen race, oh, let me tell you, that is definitely one of the races the Johnson fans and the 48 team would want to forget. Considering being involved in one of the crashes resulting 40th. Dead last. Yeah, you don't expect that from Jimmy Johnson, do you? But in this case, it happened. But enough of that. The only top 5 finish during the summer was at Indianapolis with a 3rd place finish. And speaking of that race, he ran the red vest paint scheme for the last time in that race. And I gotta say, what a badass paint scheme. But anyway, getting back on track, the other top 10 finishes were located in Bristol with a 7th and Michigan with a 6th. Heading into the chase, Johnson found himself 6 points behind Brad Keselowski. Determined more than ever, Johnson had to really push hard to the floor if he wants to advance into the following rounds that will earn him a spot in the championship four. Well, he would be in contention for a win at Chicagoland on this particular day he led 118 laps, which was the most out of anyone in the field. But then, this would ultimately ruin his potential win. 48, too fast, no pit road. 48, too fast. No, no! There's no way! A speeding ticket killed his winning chances. In the end, he would rank 12th. But thankfully, it was only the first race, as things were just getting started. Now, all the 48 team could do was make up and gain more points heading into New Hampshire and Dover. They would do just that, with finishes of 8th and 7th respectively. Now, we are in the second round of the playoffs, which is the contender round. Charlotte would be the site of the first race of the second round. In the running of the Bank of America 500, Jimmy Johnson would lead the most laps of 155. Putting on a stellar and immense performance, this would lead to an eighth Charlotte win. Down the back stretch for the final time. It has been 24 races since Jimmy Johnson, a six-time champion, a seven-time winner at this racetrack, has been to victory lane. As he comes out of four, Jimmy Johnson wins at Charlotte. Fast forward to the Eliminator round, which began at Martinsville. The 48 team would deliver another win at the paperclip for the ninth time, punching their ticket to Homestead. He has punched his ticket to Homestead. Jimmy Johnson wins in Martinsville. The next two races in Texas and Phoenix, the team would rank 11th and 38th. But that was nothing to stress about. Come Homestead for race day, they would be stressing out. Starting the race mid-pack, dealing with traffic in the early going. Chances of success and pitiful failure would come down to the final 267 laps. Despite the traffic, however, Johnson made his passes on his way to the front slowly and carefully. Stressing less and focusing more on the race was the main key to succeeding for Johnson. But as for one of his championship contenders? Kyle Larson, the outside, Carl Edwards on the inside, green play! Caution comes back out again. That would prove to be difficult. 
following Carl Edwards' untimely blocking attempt on Joey Logano, crushing Edwards' chances of winning the championship. This would now give Johnson a very high chance, and in the final restart attempt, in the final two laps of the 2016 season, the unthinkable would happen and come true. Jimmy Johnson through three and four, make room, Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt, there's another seven-time champ, Jimmy Johnson wins his seventh NASCAR Sprint Cup Championship. Release the champagne and bring on the confetti. Jimmy Johnson not only wins for the 80th time in his career, but he finally ties Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt with a record tying seven championships. If that's not enough to convince you that Johnson is one of the greatest of all time, I don't know what is. His stats from the 2016 season look like this. Five wins, 11 top fives, 16 top tens, one pole, four DNFs, led 737 laps out front, having an average finish of 14.0. With that being said and done, that wraps up today's video presentation. In the next part, which would be the last in the saga, I'll discuss Jimmy Johnson's 2017, 18, and this past season. So, with that out of the way, this is Calvin Marshall signing off, and until next time, peace out and have a good one.